Well, hi there. Good afternoon. Um, I'd, I'd like to start with a, with a question. Has someone of you ever set up a cloud infrastructure? Have you ever uh, set up a cloud infrastructure? Uh, no. No, not so far, okay. Have you ever set up a cloud infrastructure? Yep. Can you tell us uh, one or two sentences about this? Top stack, then several hundred. Ah, yeah, okay, those are <laughs> exactly uh, the, the, the key features. Well, welcome to my talk. My name is Nils Magnus. <coughs> I'm here with some kind of a split brain. I work for Innovex in, in Germany. I live in Munich and we actually do something like uh, you told us. Uh, we plan, we design, uh, consult and actually from time to time uh, uh, implement um, scalable data center infrastructures, clouds kind of. <coughs> I'm also a member of the board uh, and the program chair of Linux Tag, the conference in, uh, takes place annually uh, in Berlin, in Germany as well. And, well, the obvious disclaimers, if you are aware of uh, virtualization, configuration management and all this fancy stuff, we hire. And if you are also aware of those stuff and uh, like to talk about this, please take, place, uh, uh, take part in our call for papers. Next time of Linux Tag will be most probably uh, in June 2013. Well, as my title already suggested, uh, I'm here to uh, tell you about 10 ways how to ruin your, your cloud computing experience. Uh, I did a couple of uh, cloud projects so far and this is my way to share my experience <coughs> uh, with you and I'd really love uh, to share also the way, the way back. So if you have some comments or if you have questions, don't hesitate uh, to ask, uh, don't hesitate uh, to comment what I talked uh, about um, so we can, well, uh, have a better experience and uh, maybe enhance our experience um, to uh, avoid, well, disappointment about cloud computing. Speaking about cloud computing, anyway, what is cloud computing? I have a big problem with this term because those are just examples. Who of you uh, knows about OpenStack, the OpenStack project? Okay, quite a few. Who knows about own cloud? Ah, also, sugar CRM. Yeah. All of these free projects. There are obviously a couple of others, uh, which are the like. This is just an example, like <coughs> um, the uh, Apache stack. Uh, we've seen there. We've seen uh, Open Nebula. We've seen several other uh, storage uh, components. We've seen, uh, obviously, a couple of other software as a service projects or uh, uh, SRS uh, frameworks. Which of these is cloud computing? All of them or just one of them? It's, for me, it's very confusing, especially if you talk to other people, <coughs> uh, especially with, if you talk to uh, with, with management. Management uh, usually has heard about cloud computing, but uh, very often they have no precise idea about uh, what they're talking, what they're actually uh, looking for. Are they looking for some infrastructure as a service stack? Are they looking for some storage solution? Are they looking for a software as a service solution? And this becomes difficult if you talk to engineers because engineers uh, tend to talk with uh, very precise terms. And therefore, I prefer um, or at least what I'm doing uh, most of my time is infrastructure as a service, <coughs> um, which is the most, to my opinion, uh, technical part, or at least it's in the stack uh, the lowest, um, <coughs> virtualizing um, yeah, the infrastructure, like uh, we knew in the past uh, to install servers, we now install um, virtual machines, on top of some uh, virtualization host. 
So actually, there's no need to confuse you engineers, and I try to avoid the term cloud computing in the, uh, during uh, the rest of my talk. Please let me know if I violated this rule. <coughs> well, if you are planning to set up uh, a new um, cloud computing infrastructure as a service, um, uh, system. If you plan uh, a new data center, a new setup, a new private cloud, you name it. Um, if you have five engineers in the room, they have usually about six to seven opinions about which operating system to use, which uh, storage solution to use, uh, which hypervisor to use, and so on. <coughs> and you often hear something, uh, I heard Ubuntu server uh, does not uh, work with virtualization. Uh, the sister of uh, my brother-in-law's uh, uncle told me it did not work for him. So this must be broken. And to my opinion, it's a very uh, shaky ground uh, to make decisions on, uh, based on feelings. So... <coughs> Um, it's very important uh, to define a specification or something. What do you actually want to uh, accomplish? And based on this specification, which is hard work, actually, um, try to evaluate the potential options and evaluate them. I talked about, uh, just today, earlier today, uh, I, I talked with uh, some storage uh, guys, um, what to actually use for, for the shared storage. Somewhere you have uh, to store your um, VM images somewhere. And, wow, um, I've, uh, I got a couple of new uh, ideas and suggestions about how to implement this. And um, if you talk to the people, to the marketing people, or to the the developers, they often uh, are very excited, uh, obviously, about their solutions. But take your time, do some testing, do some test setup, and evaluate uh, the options. <coughs> Idea number three. Environments and how to set them up. At the moment, I work for, for a client um, whose business is um, actually to run a software-as-a-service um, uh, yeah, product. Uh, he has implemented the software system based on, on, on Java running in a VM. And at the moment, they have a 100, about 100 clients. And... Um, each, of the, the, the in, each instance of the software runs in a separate uh, VM. And each of these 100 um, instances have been handicrafted by hand, by the system administrators themselves. So they edited uh, the hypervisor uh, configuration files, added copy and paste a new virtual machine, edited and decided about, well, should we give this uh, four CPUs or should we give this uh, six <coughs> CPUs? And they decided on, on uh, memory and so on and so on. After this, they inserted uh, the CDs, they exported the CD images uh, to the VMs, uh, they booted them, they uh, configured the operating system. This does simply not scale. This is uh, the first problem. The, the second problem is uh, um, it is very error prone because uh, they, they showed me actually their, their wiki. They had uh, for each of their clients um, wiki pages and each page uh, consisted of uh, printed on, uh, on paper something like three or four um, um, pieces of paper. <coughs> And it's very easy to make uh, one mistake in all those steps. So don't even think about um, doing all these steps by hand. If you are planning to set up a scalable um, uh, IIS platform. And often it's uh, 
most people know this. And uh, most people use actually something like a, a configuration management system or whatever. Um, but there are um, uh, the small pitfalls like, hmm, okay, uh, we forgot in the script to set up or configure ad an additional IP address on this specific interface, for example. It's a very simple task uh, to do on a command line. But uh, if you do this um, uh, manually, you have to remember this very step for the next time and the next time and the next time. And it's uh, very likely that you forget it sooner or later, or at least once uh, in the future. So take this extra time, try to make this right, but don't overdo the whole thing, don't over-engineer. I also seen uh, situations when, when colleagues try to uh, deal with every potential situation that might come up uh, for them, for other people, or in, a in a, uh, 10 years in the future, whatever. Um, it's not an easy task uh, to, to, to find the balance uh, between the two of them. But nevertheless, if, you, uh, if you're sure that a specific task needs to be repeated twice or at least three times, it's always a good idea to, to use your configuration system uh, to implement this uh, within your Puppet, Chef, Salt Stack, whatever you name it. Next uh, subject um, stunned me at the first time when I experienced it. I was working for another client and the client uh, <coughs> insisted on um, buying some, well, some cloud computers, some infrastructure as a service, um, uh, services um, from third party. Running an enterprise level operating system on an enterprise uh, level contract. And they paid quite a, quite a lot of money for that. We said, well, it's always a good idea uh, to have commercial support as a backup. Um, you have to decide if you actually need this. But if you decide uh, that you need uh, this commercial support, that's fine. But after, after that, um, we set up the cloud infrastructure and some of my colleagues took over uh, for the actual day-to-day -day operating of this uh, cloud infrastructure we uh, earlier set up. And uh, it appeared they had some problems with, I don't remember, something that the storage was very slow in uh, certain situations. And they complained and they complained and they said, okay, you have this very expensive support uh, contract uh, with your service provider, please call them and open a, open a bug and uh, insist on, on have this fixed or at least have this uh, investigated. But, uh, well, we, we, could, we could try to give it more uh, memory or we could try to set up another machine or we could try uh, rebooting several times without saving all our data or something like that. Um, <coughs> but they um, were not willing actually to, to, to call and uh, insist on the SLAs. Well. So my opinion to um, high money uh, uh, service level agreements is a little bit split because um, it's often a decision to, well, trade off fear with money or something like that. So uh, if we pay you this amount of money and uh, if something goes wrong, we may blame some, someone else. And I'm not sure if this is a very good basis for infrastructure as a service or in all a technical, um, a technical project. So think about what you actually uh, want and what your personal service level agreements are. What's this? I think it's number five. 
Yeah, the eternal battle between developers and operations, operations teams. Um, is uh, someone of you uh, working as a developer who is actually writing code? Oh yeah, quite a few. And uh, who of you is, uh, is responsible of uh, actually running, uh, running some uh, infrastructure, some servers, whatever? Okay, I think the admins are slightly in the majority. Um, and who of you have experienced either as an, as an admin, as a system engineer, as an uh, uh, ops guy, uh, that uh, the developer sent you some broken code or some uh, poorly documented stuff, uh, uh, something that was uh, difficult to run or was error prone or something like that? So, yeah, okay. And who of you developers complained uh, about the, the nosy um, and uh, arrogant uh, admins? They just don't do uh, what they're supposed to and uh, have their own way. Please raise your hand. Okay. Yeah. Well, very, very polite, very polite uh, audience today. Yeah. Wow. Obviously, uh, there are two um, there are two groups, and there are uh, two sets of duties that uh, still have to be done. But working together and talking together is probably uh, most of the time a very good idea. And we tried several several approaches to overcome a little bit this this uh, this gap of the the two groups. So, um, a colleague uh, recently told me that they uh, invited their, uh, he was also an administrator, they invited um, one of the development um, guys uh, to join their team and actually do one of their software deployments or something like that for, for a week or for, for a new release, I think. And that was very helpful because uh, at that point, the developer learned uh, the, the, the problem that uh, comes with uh, running and, and administrating um, a server system and uh, the problems with undocumented log files and, and, and stuff on, uh, like that. And on the other hand, uh, they sent one of their administrators uh, to actually um, do some uh, pair programming together with the uh, development team. And that was also uh, very helpful, how it looks like uh, to do coding without proper uh, permissions, without a root account, for example. Um, <coughs> and they learned a, uh, a lot uh, from each other. There are a couple of new ideas like Scrum and Kanban and uh, Agile, um, Agile uh, methods which are very, or are, are quite common, uh, at least in the, in the developer uh, community these days. Who is actually uh, using some of these uh, methods like Scrum or Kanban? May I, may I please raise your hand. And who uh, has never heard of any of these uh, methods? Oh, okay. Well, oh, that's less than I expected. So my impression it, uh, is that um, the whole idea of Scrum and Kanban uh, uh, is not that widespread, uh, widespread uh, in the um, uh, operating uh, community uh, compared uh, to the um, development community. But it's, uh, uh, it's still rising, uh, the, the number is rising and um, there might be some good ideas in there. To my opinion, there's also some kind of voodoo uh, stuff uh, involved with this uh, as well. But if you seriously go and try these methods to, to work together and work as a team, and um, um, sometimes they call it a DevOps, um, uh, I made some uh, good experience from that. 
and it helps in your day-to-day -day job to understand what the others are doing. <laughs> yeah, if you set up uh, a cloud infrastructure, uh, there are a couple of components uh, involved usually. There is the virtualization engine, there is the um, configuration management, there is the storage layer, uh, <coughs> there are deployment tools, and so on and so on. And for example, uh, a friend of mine uh, was not satisfied with the existing uh, deployment tools. Uh, for example, w we had a look into Puppet, for example, and uh, <coughs> Puppet is uh, written underneath in, I think in Ruby, is that true? Yeah. Uh, but he did not like Ruby. He was a poor guy. And he said, well, okay, I can do better. I write my own uh, configuration management system uh, in Perl. <coughs> and, well, this is actually quite a task. And uh, to be honest, uh, he, he wrote uh, a rather decent system. But it's very hard to maintain something like that. Uh, like that. Um, <coughs> don't en uh, underestimate um, the work that is uh, necessary to support and enhance and to debug and to maintain such, uh, uh, such a system. The same applies to writing small shell scripts here and there and uh, writing a shell script that uh, automates the um, initialization uh, of the virtual machines and another uh, script uh, that uh, pushes the configuration on there and another shell script that um, rolls out the software and so on. It's very difficult uh, to maintain uh, these uh, small scripts and the key point is standardization here. Standardization is a very strong weapon if it's uh, used right because there's so many other people you can talk about this. You can Google uh, uh, problems. You can most of the time even Google the answers, uh, which is uh, um, even uh, more useful. And if you join forces with, with other developers, with other uh, admins, uh, it's much easier um, <coughs> to set up something um, which is easier to maintain. Yeah, well, we invent the beer, and it's also sometimes it's a little bit about uh, not invented here. You probably know this uh, because we wrote this uh, uh, this small tool. We actually uh, want to use it, even if we know there is something which does more or less the same uh, job, but has some other features. Well. However, your, your mileage may vary in this uh, situation. Hmm, okay, I, uh, I'm interested in your opinion about uh, this experience. When I set up um, a cloud infrastructure, um, another again for, for a client, um, we, we, we finished that project and after that we, we set up uh, an extensive set of um, monitoring hooks and did a lot of monitoring and um, uh, spent some time uh, doing uh, log TV watching and, and look for the fancy, uh, fancy graphs and so on and he pointed out, wow, look at this machine. It's utilized uh, more than 60%. Uh, I think we have to throw in uh, more CPU on this, or, or was it memory? I don't remember. But it's my opinion that, especially in the virtualized uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, this is kind of a waste of resources. Because if you run a proper uh, cloud infrastructure, everything, or at least the, 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 the key um, uh, parameters, should be elastic, should be adaptable. So if your application actually needs more, uh, more memory, 
it should get more memory. And uh, that's what a scheduler is for. Uh, if you see uh, you reach a certain uh, threshold, you should just, and um, most probably automatically, uh, raise the assigned uh, amount of memory. Same applies to, um, uh, to disk space and to CPU utilization. But having a virtual machine idling 40% uh, of its time, it's just a waste of resources. It's obviously not that easy uh, uh, in reality because you always have peak times and depending on your, uh, uh, on your business and depending on uh, what, you, what you actually do, um, you won't have a, a flat line of uh, resources uh, over a day, over a 24 hours uh, period or uh, during, um, uh, during a week or whatever. But if you look closely uh, to your graphs, and I hope you have a monitoring system in place, uh, you can use this uh, very good for that. <coughs> um, you should look for um, ways uh, to adapt the necessary resources uh, to your need. For to, just to give you an example, um, one of my clients was in a, was a big TV station and uh, their web servers uh, have been very, uh, to a, a big degree, utilized uh, during the, the evening when the people looked the TV shows and looked up something they had on the screen or whatever. <coughs> and so they needed more CPU and, and especially memory during that period. On the other hand, um, the developers themselves coding this uh, website always demi demanded uh, more memory because of their tests and their optimizations and stuff. So we decided and set up uh, a scheduling uh, task that assigned uh, during uh, the morning and the early afternoon um, to shift the memory more to the development uh, and staging um, clusters. And in the evening, when the um, developers left the office at 5 o'clock or something, uh, we shifted back uh, the memory and the CPU um, to the web servers again. So if you go for cloud, you should also use the feature that comes with it. I already talked about uh, environments. Um, I think it's pretty common practice uh, nowadays to have one production environment and at least one uh, testing or staging uh, environment. Um, who of you uh, uses something like that with a, a multi-level? Ah, okay, most of them. And um, I'm interested in how many different environments do you actually run? Do you run uh, with uh, two environments, please? Uh, three? Five. Five. Oh, three. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, interesting. Um, I've seen all of those um, setups. Um, if you have. Uh, just two environments. It's uh, sometimes difficult uh, to test for well, different groups of, of developers. Um, but on the other hand, if you have uh, five uh, testing environments or, or five environments uh, in total, um, are they actually all looking like the production environments? No, no is the answer. Not now. <laughs> There's a plan. Ah, okay, the plan is, um, having a plan is always a good idea. Yeah, okay. <coughs> the key point about majority environments is uh, to have them as close uh, as the production environment is, because that's the whole point of it. Um, if you check for something that is simply not uh, 
mapping to the reality uh, that uh, it's going to run uh, after the, the, the real, the live deployment. Uh, why did you uh, make all the uh, effort in the first place? So it's important to have a configuration system that uh, has its sources in a single place. I think this is a good uh, best practice. Um, so we tried uh, to um, refactor our configuration system, for example, um, to have as much as possible from a, from a single source. We actually put all our configurations into a um, uh, software control system, depending on the client, uh, a subversion or a Git rep repository. And um, we don't use um, the configuration uh, files directly, but we pull it from the uh, repository. And we try to have as much common configuration code as possible and have a very lean uh, layer of um, things like the actual names and the actual <laughs> numbers uh, of virtual machines um, that get applied to this uh, set of configurations. This is really hard work to do, but um, it saved us uh, a lot of work uh, in the long run. Um, it's always a battle, especially if you talk to management, uh, uh, to assign the proper uh, resources, especially in, in terms of, of developers, of, of admins, of end of time, on end of affair, especially on their time. Um, but if you convince them uh, to give you these resources, to my opinion, it usually pays off rather quickly after a couple of weeks or uh, or at least months um, to enhance your configuration and, and, and other components as well. Scalability. Scalability is a nice feature if you have it, but it's also expensive. Um, but it's even more expensive if you don't plan it and uh, forget to implement. So if you have ever hard-coded in your code that there is just one database and, I don't know, several, uh, the, the database is referenced from the code in uh, 20 uh, different uh, locations, it's very hard um, to set up um, that uh, changes that, so you can scale better. For example, well, uh, add more read slaves uh, for a database. Well, or, well you, you name it, it depends uh, obviously on the, on the architecture uh, you set up. But scalability planned uh, in the beginning is always something that pays off in the long run. This is number 10, the 10th way to ruin your cloud experience. It's a non-technical experience I made. Uh, there are so many uh, problems that actually don't need a technical solution. Uh, I bet uh, a lot of people come up with very uh, well, fancy and enhanced uh, ideas um, uh, to work around and to model this apparent problem. Like, you know, I, I said, you, well, it's a little bit exaggerated, but I experienced something like that. How would you, how should we implement the <coughs> uh, SSD backed hot failover, high availability enhanced LDAP driven role based user management for just you and me, for example. Isn't it enough to, in this case, uh, share the root password, which might be easier to, uh, uh, to implement. Not that I'm a big fan of shared passwords, uh, uh, to the least, but um, 
it is well we, we just failed at this situation to think about is this necessary for the business case or the use case or whatever and there are so many situations uh, I hope that uh, the people who actually implemented that um, had thought about this uh, in the first place so less is more sometimes because if you have a simpler architecture it's easier to maintain it's easier for you uh, to enhance the important parts of it and uh, to ha have a more stable overall installation well these have been my um, 10 ways how to ruin your cloud experience and I hoped uh, that I uh, actually gave you some well, ideas where to um, where to start in your day-to-day -day work. This is my contract uh, information. If you like to uh, ask me something or have a suggestion, feel free to contact me or just ask right now and give some suggestions, some some opinions. However, thank you very much uh, for coming here and for attending the session. <laughs> Are there questions or remarks? Yeah. For the case of uh, preparing of uh, further scalability issues, have you ever had a need for preparing a uh, document like uh, you will save further that much money because you'll have much more uh, network interface cards? Uh, that will be tending with and handle that kinds of traffic in the future. So, uh, in your everyday work, do you have to convince the clients that you need that scalability in the future? Yeah, well, um, usually um, that's necessary. Uh, most of them think about scalability uh, anyway, but um, not all the time in all situations and I think that's that's fine and actually that's what we are for um, so um, if you have a special mindset and if you have set up uh, uh, an application stack before you obviously think about the problems that have been uh, arising in, in the past and it's our job uh, doing some consulting and, and find out which might become a bottleneck in the future. Well, if it comes to, uh, to the conclusions, well, it depends, obviously, because um, someone uh, who is um, actually uh, uh, running one server with uh, free uh, directly attached uh, terabyte drivers uh, is hardly convinced uh, to pay for a uh, high scalable uh, geo uh, delocated uh, storage solution whatever so it's just necessary to do to find the right balance I think but talking about takes place yeah yeah over there do you see a typical pattern in the type of customers that start to pick this up Pardon? Do you see a typical pattern in the ah. of custom, customers that start rolling this stuff out? Yeah, um, yeah, I do some, I do see some patterns. Um, one of the, the, the patterns I see is uh, that the whole idea of cloud computing, the elasticity uh, and stuff, uh, is often underestimated. Most of my clients are still stuck with virtualization and they don't think uh, uh, about the, the idea that goes beyond virtualization but scaling and automatization and, and stuff like that. And that is uh, at the moment, um, uh, most of our work has to do with something like that. And we have to try to uh, explain the advantages of 
the good cloud computing uh, without sticking just to the marketing blah blah you know and uh, trying to show them the actual advantages they have um, so your system administrator at the moment needs uh, about one day to set up a new client after you set up uh, the proposed uh, changes uh, it should be possible uh, to set up a new client for him uh, within one hour so it's an advantage uh, and so he gets eight times fast or something like that and um, well but it's hard to generalize have you uh, have you made uh, different experiences no i was just wondering i come from a different background but i was just wondering who, who is willing to take the first step in, in sort of like internal clouds certainly in germany you know i mean who are the interesting partners yeah um, uh, well there are uh, obvious in, uh, advantages money wise for example if you uh, um, look for the numbers uh, to run say 50 machines 50 servers which can be well, depending on the setup the five six seven eight uh, uh, virtualization holes uh, and setting up some configuration management on top of this uh, this makes sense uh, not only for the very big uh, organizations but today and those are most of our clients, uh, uh, medium-sized um, uh, companies who just want to oh, save money, save, save power, save workforce. Not local governments, that sort of thing? Yeah, well, the local governments, mm, I have no clients uh, within, uh, within uh, public administrations. Um, <coughs> A couple of friends are on actually on the uh, on the uh, other side of the, the table, and they consider this um, cloud computing uh, is, at least to my opinion, uh, for public administration, still something they carefully well uh, evaluate. Maybe it takes another year or two. I don't know. I um, follow rather closely, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, what the, uh, what the uh, uh, guys from kernel development uh, actually do uh, um, if it comes to facilities uh, with uh, monitoring uh, of um, uh, data uh, from the Linux kernel and so on. But this is usually not, not to the uh, least, uh, the problem. Um, we, uh, we had a problem, uh, uh, so I um, talked about uh, the example um, with the service uh, provider that um, <coughs> hosted the, uh, the private cloud for our client. And to set up a new VM, for example, took them uh, under the SLA two days what? two days and actually it took them usually about three days because they uh, edited uh, the configuration files they uh, did copy and paste they had uh, a complex uh, process uh, involved and so on and I said, well, this is cloud computing. You should be able uh, to point your browser to a website and uh, click on uh, add a new uh, virtual machine. But they did not do it this day. And these kinds uh, of problems are 
much more common uh, than non-working C-groups uh, in, in, in a kernel subsystem or something like that. Because, well, it comes uh, to, to real technical problems. You usually uh, easily come to technical solutions if you talk to the right people. Any uh, last question? I, I've been <laughs> uh, shown that we have uh, only a few minutes left. It appears everything is answered. Thank you again, one, uh, for your attending. <laughs>